Hi, everybody. Welcome to this live cast, Designing Circular Cities. Great to have you all here. Great to have you all at home. My name is Thomas van der Zand. I'm a programmer here at Pakhuis de Zwijger on sustainability. And at Pakhuis de Zwijger, we are, um, yeah, we are uh, involved in several international projects on design, on makership, on circularity. And the great thing is that these uh, a lot of these international projects come here together tonight a lot of people a lot of uh, designers a lot of uh, fab city makers researchers uh, the the cities that are involved there are here in Amsterdam uh, today and that's why we thought it would be a good idea to have this conversation here tonight and uh, I'm very delighted to present our first guest here all the way from Barcelona uh, she is uh, actually involved in two of the projects that we are going to talk about today. The one is uh, distributed design, of which we'll talk later, and the other is Centrino. And uh, she is uh, from FabLab Barcelona. Welcome, Kate Armstrong. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yes. And uh, please give it up for Kate Armstrong, because there are people <laughs> here, and we would like to hear you as well. So um, I was talking a little bit about uh, this distributed design and you are the coordinator of this project. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, it would be my pleasure. So distributed design is a platform. It's co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. And it brings together 18 members across 13 um, European states uh, to work on the idea of how we can progress design beyond the industrial paradigm that we are very used to and we currently have, basically, um, towards something that is more open, more sustainable, um, more collaborative, and also more ecosystemic in the way that it works. So how we do this is by looking at the way we produce and consume in cities and putting design into that equation in order to not only develop local circularity and local ways of design and making, but also how we can connect at distance through networks. Okay, so uh, a great one-liner that I heard was, so we keep the atoms local and we keep the bits global. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly it. This comes from the Fab Lab network, which is kind of core to the way or the way that this project has started to develop because the Fab Lab network, um, maybe for those who are watching, um, this is basically a, a distributed infrastructure, a bit distributed making infrastructure connected with the exact same uh, machines in every lab globally, every lab worldwide. And there's 2000 of these labs worldwide. And they're all connected by kind of a communications infrastructure that we have access to today. So this means that we can be making things in, I don't know, let's say Barcelona, sending the files to you in Amsterdam, and you can make the exact same thing because you have the same infrastructure. So with these logics, uh, the platform is really looking at, okay, well, it's not just Fab Labs in this ecosystem. Who else is involved? And how can we bring this logic beyond the Fab Lab, beyond the makerspace and into society in order to really, as I said, make, you know, more sustainable, more inclusive ways to design. So, so can you give a great example of distributed design going beyond the Fab Lab? Yeah, I mean, you're going to hear some this evening, so I don't yes. want to give any, any a kind of, you know, for, mm. foreshadow what we're seeing. Um, but I think we can really look at how, you know, Fab Labs are also becoming part of the neighborhood and really becoming part of, you know, the infrastructures of making that we have. For example, tonight we'll not only hear from the makerspace or the Fab Lab, we're going to hear from mid to small level factories, production facilities, and all of these spaces are involved in how we change the paradigm we currently have in terms of making production and consumption. So, yeah, I think we're yeah, I think we're going to hear some good examples. So I'm not going to give too many. Okay, okay. <laughs> we don't give away too much no. already. No, no, no. So uh, you're you're also here in Amsterdam today because of an other European project. Yeah. And that one is Centrino. Yes. And we, we love the abbreviations in, in Europe. But do you know what Centrino stands for? Oof, that is a really good question. It is, uh, oh, I thought maybe we were going to get it on the on the backdrop to, to cheat, but no. Um, it's centra centers of historic regeneration in Europe. We can go with something like that. Yeah, and, and but uh, the more important question is, is what it's about. 
So it's kind of what I was just saying, but it's looking specifically at the embedding these ecosystems of productive um, capacity into um, historic centres or, or ex-historic or old historic spaces in the city that are under transition already in order to ensure that tradition that transition towards more productive capacity in the city is done with society with people with um yeah with with makers but also with other parts of of the community yeah so we use historic production spaces mm -hmm. to uh transition into this new kind of production yeah. this new uh um ecosystem of uh, yeah. if you will of makers uh, having this sustainable new cities right yeah and it's really important that it brings together um, also education so you know ways of educating that that are vocational ed education and also it really focuses on the fab city hub as a concept which is something that is really central we we feel is central to embedding these ideas in the city it's a space that is um not only physical but also conceptual and brings together making with the necessity of the city yeah and we see some of the cities we see oh, yeah. uh, all of the cities that are involved here in the, in the map behind me so uh yeah it's it's really great that there is so much distribution of cities mm -hmm. and so much different cities and regions uh, participating in it. So we have uh, Amsterdam, we have uh, Paris, we have Barcelona, Milan, but we also have Blondewis in, in Iceland, mm -hmm. which uh, they, they have different uh, different regions, different uh, things that they have to deal with. Um, so, so I guess uh, when you... So, so what is the connection between or the overlap between distributed design and Centrino? So there are a lot of overlaps, not only in the, the members, the partners who are part of this project. We have um, quite a few who are who are linked in their in their practice, but I think in terms of the concept, what we're we're looking at is how do we develop these historic new sites of production in the city through uh, Centrino and through distributed design. We're looking at well, what's the cultural and societal need to actually enable those sites to be productive and to move forward, um, specifically through the lens of design. So distributed design runs you know a whole program um, across Europe throughout the year so everything from accelerators to you know making books to developing you know, an award which I hope we hear from tonight because we have one a winner in the room yes um, so we have all these type, kinds of different um, activities and all of this is really about raising the profile of these makers who are really at the forefront of changing the way our cities work so we are now going to start with raising the profiles of these makers Excellent. and of these designers because uh, we have actually eight examples of uh, distributed design here or distributed designers here. Uh, with Pakhuis de Zwijger, we uh, made the connection between distributed design and circular cities. So we asked uh, designers that uh, use the principles of, uh, of distributed design for creating circular cities or for creating opportunities for circular cities. And uh, we have eight initiatives here tonight. And uh, we, uh, we did some great workshops with them. We profiled them on our website. So please have a look at our website as well and the stories that they tell. Uh, but here uh, we're going to speed up and they're going to do 90 second pitches. So uh, we asked them to do the impossible, but to introduce themselves in, in 90 seconds and to tell uh, how they apply distributed design uh, for circularity in a city like Amsterdam, but also in other cities. Uh, we have people here in the studio and we have people in Zoom, but I want to introduce uh, the first of our pictures. Uh, she uh, is from Fiction Factory, um, a great place uh, here in Amsterdam North uh, that is... Um, uh, doing all these kind of woodwork for uh, for furniture for uh, uh, for events and stuff like that and um, well you can tell what kind of project you did Marije Remigius. So uh, I'm Marije Remigius. 
please please talk into the microphone. Talk so to the microphone. Very yeah, good. Yeah. Yes, oh, I'm here. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so I am Marije Remigi, Sustainability Manager at Fiction Factory. And uh, Fiction Factory is an interior building company based here in Amsterdam, as Thomas already said. And um, we, with 50 to 80 uh, specialists, my colleagues, we weld, we saw, we upholster, we 3D print, we CNC, uh, custom built business to business interiors. So, and uh, all the interiors that we build um, can last for a very long time, but our clients, uh, yeah, well, they, they tend to want new stuff. So everything um, uh, that we build will only last for maybe one hour, a day, three days, three months, but maximum to 10 years. So um, a few years ago, I did research in circular economy, and then I realized that I have been building um, very beautiful waste for more than 20 years. So, well... So I decided to change this and uh, start up a new way of working. And, uh, and this uh, I did with changing my, the, the needs of my clients, but also the way we produce stuff. But of course, we cannot do this alone. So I opened up the factory and uh, tried to set up a community and, uh, you know, try to work also open source and share the knowledge that we have. <laughs> Well, the 90 seconds are going far, way too fast. But, yeah, uh, but please uh, so this is yeah. uh, this is what we do, and uh, uh, yeah, and so this knowledge is what we share also uh, online. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Please have a seat at the table, and we're going to continue talking. And I want to introduce uh, our next designer, Pablo Pincus, and uh, he is the founder of the uh, Stichting Elektrisch Varen, and he has brought props with him, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Pablo. Yeah, this is our uh, official flag. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, please uh, do your pitch. We live in times of uh, prosperous digital networks and precarious distribution of fossil fuels. I would like to introduce you to our contribution to the ongoing energy transition and meanwhile also contemplate with you about the importance of new physical infrastructures. The city of Amsterdam has a fleet of about 10,000 pleasure boats and a network of 600 kilometers of waterways. A network which is interconnected with the metropolitan region, the neighboring cities and in fact with the whole navigable world. We think this city is the best place on the planet to start a pilot for an infrastructure of battery charge and swap stations for electric boats. Such infrastructure could be a blueprint for a smart, sustainable and efficient transition to emission-free transport. With our solution, the complete conversion to electric propul propulsion can be achieved within a few years. The idea founds on portable, swappable and shared batteries a widely accessible membership system, low investment and maintenance costs, and the integration of a closed loop for all resources. In a city, a new infrastructure can generate socio-economical benefits for decades. We should start to not only see the city as an economical distribution site, but also respect it as a residential, educational, and recreational area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join us at the table. So we have a full table here now, but we have uh, somebody uh, joining us uh, online through Zoom. Jiao Liao. And uh, I, I don't know. I'm sorry that I uh, didn't check if I pronounced it correctly. I hope so. Yeah, I see a thumbs up. So that's great. And uh, he's going to tell us more about what he's doing at Viva Lab in, uh, uh, so, so in Porto. I should say. Okay, we can't hear you. Is your microphone on? Yep. Ah, on. Okay, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Please start. Thank you, Thank you Thomas. Uh, so Viva Lab, it's a fab lab in uh, Porto. It's a fab lab from Porto. It's a place that we want to inspire people to learn and innovate through making so that together we can change uh, our world for uh, the better. Um, at Viva Lab, we are working, like Kate said, in areas that's very important, education, where we see that a lot of people don't know how to make and uh, so that we can create a distributed city. We are working together with city halls, uh, municipalities and, and uh, schools and universities to bring the knowledge on how to make uh, within cities and at the same time create innovation through design so that people can use the Fab Lab network uh, to create projects that uh, can have social uh, innovation within cities. 
Um, Pet Mini, it's a skateboard that you're seeing in the slides. It's one of the many projects that we developed that has this premise uh, embedded in it. And the idea was to uh, not only teach people, because uh, the whole project is open source, so that can, people can learn how to do the electronics, do the um, skateboard and, and so on, but also through that knowledge, how they can um, and inspire them to create uh, impactful uh, projects that can uh, change the city for, for the better. All right, great, thank you. So please join us digitally and we'll come back to you uh, in, uh, during the talk here at the table. Uh, welcome all, Maria, to start with you. So uh, yeah, it was difficult to do in 90 seconds. Tell so much about this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the, the basic part of it is that you have all these CNC machines uh, in which you uh, work wood with mm -hmm. and you have a lot of waste with that and you uh, did a lot of solutions to both reduce the, the waste and to use the waste in a, in a, in a productive way mm -hmm. and then you share that with the rest of the world. Did, did a lot yes. of people pick that up? <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that we are not the only one with a CNC machine, right? Yeah. So, uh, and the thing is, is that, uh, yeah, I think on average, every sheet that we put on the CNC router machine for the wood industry, uh, that is, has a sort of like a 30% uh, of waste. And uh, so everyone put a sheet on is throwing away one third of a sheet. So, um, yeah, so this, I think everyone should be worried about this. But um, uh, the thing is, is that material doesn't cost so much. Yeah. Now it's changing a bit with COVID. So why worry about uh, 10 euros? So, uh, but if you produce quite a lot like us and, and other companies, maybe even more, I think we should worry about it. And it's such, such a waste, you know, all these materials coming all over the world to the Netherlands and then we throw them away. Yeah, so it's, it's really, uh, for you, it's an internal motivation to be working with this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think um, sort of like 50% uh, of the wood that we buy, we throw away. And this is caused by the CNC router machine because 80% of our work comes from the CNC machine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you are a great uh, example of makership here in the city of Amsterdam. And uh, uh, so the city wants to be like half circular in 2030, right? That's very early and it's a very big goal. Uh, but something that is often forgotten, I, I feel, is that we need makers like you, we need maker spaces like you to be able to, to create this local ecosystem where we actually make things in Amsterdam. What yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, I've, yeah, yeah. I really highly recommend it, right? Because um, uh, we have to, you know, it's it's like everyone needs stuff, right? We couldn't sit on this table if we didn't have the makers and and the, the, the interior builders. And uh, so um, to keep this in the city, we can also share also the materials that come out of it, right? So the thing at this moment is, is that if I want to use uh, reuse materials, like used materials, I cannot find them at all. So uh, just across our street, there is a collecting uh, for the for the big waste of all the community and. And I cannot harvest it over there. So this is the whole new system that we have to create for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And I really am I'm, I'm in need of these materials. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're in need of these materials. Yeah. Use materials. If I want to build circular from the start, I have to use use materials. And and where where would you like to get them from? Well. Of course, I wanted the easiest way. So I need another company to make sheets out of it, right? Or uh, um, and even you know, if if I get uh, harvest these materials, I also have want people to harvest materials from me as well because I don't use the little stuff. But I've, I'm, of course, uh, there is in my ecosystem people who want this little stuff. So um, yeah, so to make this circular and close the loop. Yeah, together. Yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. So um, maybe this is for everybody watching. Yeah. <laughs> you need the stuff. I need the stuff, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, but it's also important, right? I also need people who want my stuff as well. So to create this ecosystem, right? So this, with this dis distributed design, uh, you know, I'm, the CNC machine is digital. Mm -hmm. Send in your files and we can CNC it, right? But it's, I now have to sort of like make a new software system maybe as well to sort of like import it more easily so to you know use this because it's i have to fight against this 10 euros of material to produce efficiently yeah, yeah. and and uh, i want to get back a little bit to the the makership in the city because it's not only uh uh the the people working in the uh we're working in the different companies like yours but also makership has gone out of just the citizens of amsterdam a little bit is that 
that's something you said before, and I, I <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to uh, guess why you think that's uh, well. You know, we important. we have a lot we have a lot of clients, right? They yeah. come over to us because they want something to be made, and then they enter our factory, and then they say, "Oh, you're really making it." Yeah. And this is something that really happens quite a lot. And I'm just so surprised because they, they were coming to me, right? Because I was making it. But making, this is sort of a thing that has sort of like, I don't know, got out of people's system. You know, I think that everyone thinks it comes from China or somewhere else. But no, it's it's in our cities and we need this craftsmanship. And I, I need I need also craftsmen people to uh, to come and work with us. So, um, yeah. 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 So, so uh, Pablo, for you, it's a little bit different uh, because uh, you are um, actually a creative yourself, but you work together with the, the technical people and the people that could make uh, the, the things for, for what you're doing, right? Yeah. Actually, that was not in the beginning. That was not so much my plan because actually I'm also a passionate maker and uh, yeah, I try out stuff and... and uh, uh, once I had this idea, I actually was not so much aware that it will need such a systemic change to implement it, <laughs> because I thought that's just a good idea. Let's do it. Um, so for me, it was a very steep learning curve to realize, um, yeah, how complex systemic changes are to to get them implemented. Yeah. So so what you're what you're actually doing is creating a. a pool of, uh, of batteries that can be used in these electric vessels, uh, the, the, the boats that are uh, going around Amsterdam, for example, and uh, then they can uh, they can swap the, the batteries at, at this uh, charging station, right? Right, and that sounds actually pretty easy, but the thing is, uh, the thing is with this, uh, you have these network effects and it will only work if it has a certain size. Yeah. So you cannot do it with two um, swap stations, it will not work, like economically not, but also not, there is no uh, practical use for the, for, the, for the customers. So it needs a size, so you need to invest in it first. And yeah, somehow I started to realize later that it is actually a, a, counter, a counter infrastructure it could be <laughs> somehow because we need all these goods and energy that come in the city, but we also need maybe other networks um, for recreation, for example. And, uh, and I just like so much about uh, the water and boating that it is so slow. Yeah. And actually that also, uh, um, you know, this, this energy question is so much, you know, you can, you can really carry a lot of weight with boats yeah. with little, uh, with little, little effort and, uh, so uh, you know that it's just like a, it's just like physics that we it takes so much energy to move a car, um, and and most of it actually uh, is just the car itself the energy it needs. Yeah, and and While, so, yeah, yeah, and and uh, so uh, you originally uh, made this this for Amsterdam, uh, I guess. But do you think it could be used anywhere around the world? Yeah, because uh, um, yeah, it can be used anywhere, and I think it's just uh, wise to to start to start it up in a place where you have the infrastructure, like uh, waterways <laughs> and also boats. But it can be it can be done ev everywhere, I yeah. think. And uh, yeah. yeah, so so that's the, the 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 power of the distributed design that you were talking about. Is there something that was striking to you about the pitches and about the stories that we hear here? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, one of the most powerful things about actually all of the projects that are here is this kind of experience of the designer. And what is really interesting about that is that no one, you know, no two experiences are the same. And yet each one is really becoming the catalyst in their ecosystem to make that change. You know, the, the questions about you, that you have in Fiction Factory are the same, probably the same questions in many fab labs, many maker spaces. And it takes the designer to say, hey, actually, we are kind of central to these systems. And I, I really feel that that's what Distributed Design Platform is really looking to do. It's about empowering designers to say, that they have a role in creating what the future city is. And I also think all of the examples show this ne necessity of, of that designer not working alone. You know, you can't work alone. You cannot 
single-handedly go and collect those scraps and move them to your workshop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It takes systemic design, which is what you were saying. And I think that those kinds of, you know, those kinds of things are not going to happen overnight and it takes, you know, it takes a village. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I do really think that through projects like Centrino and through projects like Distributed Design, you know, we're turning on light bulbs across different ways of and different and different areas and different kinds of actors and stakeholders that are necessary. Yeah. So uh, let me get to Jiao. Hi. It takes a village, and uh, you are actually uh, really shaking up the village uh, of Porto, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We we are working together with this the municipality. Uh, we have several projects, uh, but we are trying to work with the community. Um, and bringing the, this concept of the distributed design uh, within the city. And actually, there's, there's two projects that are interesting to talk about. Uh, one is that we are trying to build a, a materials library that the, the municipality wants to make using waste, where people or designers can go and just um, uh, go and fetch waste to, to make the, the uh, whatever project you, you want to do, like, like you mentioned that, okay, I have a, a piece of wood or acrylic that it's small for my projects, but for sure a designer has some kind of material. So, so, so that's the system. solution to uh, the challenge that Marie was talking about, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. And that's you're developing that in Porto. And, and then the other is the, uh, the COVID pandemic. It gave a, a, an, a, an amazing example of uh, how distributed design can have an impact within the cities. And we did a project together with the Wiki Factory called Makers versus COVID, where we uh, contacted the two main local hospitals in Porto and we uh, made an inquiry of what they needed in terms of PPEs. And then um, after a day, we had uh, working functional prototypes of every uh, PPE that they needed. And they were amazed because they thought it would take like a month or a week to prototype their needs. And then all of a sudden they have a working prototype uh, in their doorstep. And they said, okay, we need to produce. So we basically shook up the city. As you said, we contacted the 24 seamstresses that were working in their houses. We cut all of the fabrics and distributed within the city. We contacted the city hall to help us with the distribution of the materials. We had makers, 3D printing. We Everything that we designed uh, from the face shield that were laser cut because they were efficient to cut uh, instead of taking an hour to print, it took one minute to laser cut, and it was all, sh- all shared open source for free in the Wikifactory uh, platform, so that anyone could uh, download. So at Viva Lab, we and with the community import, we produced over sixteen thousand uh, PPEs during two yeah, months that's great. of work, and we had feedback from Wikifactory that uh, one hundred and thirty-eight downloads were made from our files and. We only had f- feedback from six of them, and those six they produced over fifty-three thousand uh, PPEs around the world. Ah, that's great! So, so if you extrapolate that, it's going to be a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, this but, was a, a, a great example of how we can create an impact within the city when we uh, listen to the needs of the city, and at the same time we tap into the community and, and the designers that are working there. And at the same time, distribute the manufacturing so that we can have yeah. uh, a better impact. And that, that, for example, that, that's an example from from COVID, from the COVID crisis. But yeah. we have an uh, ecological crisis, and uh, we, we yeah. have a crisis uh, with materials and uh, with the uh, with the climate. So, uh, do you how how that's do you one, translate these lessons to circularity? If we yeah, absolutely. So, uh, one of the projects that we are working with municipalities also and and. Uh, companies is the precious plastic that uh, it's so near and dear to the Fab Lab community. Um, it's a project uh, developed by Dave Hackens uh, yeah. from the Netherlands. And basically it's for machines that want to uh, tap into the recycling of plastic and uh, once again teach communities how they can build their own machines or use one of these machines to uh, create um, uh, a new ec- ecosystem of recycling and creating new value through waste within uh, cities. So yeah. basically at Viva, we are uh, building the machines uh, to the municipalities that uh, don't have the means to do it. But our main focus is to uh, educate uh, people on how to use these machines and at the same time develop 
the products with them. So yeah. the, the project is amazing. And, and yeah, we, we are working from uh, fishermen and, and their families and using the waste that they collect and teaching them the, the importance of, of recycling that waste and not uh, throwing it again to the sea and bringing it to the coast and creating a new value for them to recycle and, and create new income yeah. so that when there's no fishing, they can have uh, an impact at the same time. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a great project as well. So, uh, uh, Maria, there was this uh, one uh, or maybe maybe solution that's here. So I think there's a great connection with you and Zhao as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, we should connect. Maybe I should visit Porto. Totally. <laughs> see how they do it over there. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do you think that about the like the opportunities of the digitized world to to connect this this global network of collaborators on like democratizing production and and doing that for things like circularity well well the thing is is that uh, i've been doing research in this open source uh, way of working as an sme and uh, um, uh, so we have been sharing also things on wiki factory but what i also found out that we're not sharing in the factory itself so mm. every day we yeah. produce new stuff mm. and we engineer new things and you know like amazing things but we don't even even share it within the company so mm. for us it's for me it's also right to share this within the company you have to <laughs> have open innovation within the company yes, as well yes right? yes yeah. but you yeah. see you know how small your ecosystem can be or your community that you have yeah. to create but yeah of course um, uh, making it bigger is better and uh, uh, yeah and this is yeah you know we, we have such great ideas and uh, solutions that we have to share right because yeah. if you share knowledge it can only grow yeah so so Pablo there was one thing you mentioned in your interview that uh, you wanted to create an equal society for future generations I, I found that very uh, uh, yeah that's very right. inspiring <laughs> <laughs> yeah I actually would like to say something about uh, the distributed... Can you, can you really talk into the microphone? Yeah. I would like to say something about the distributed design mm -hmm. because I think uh, it's, the, yeah, it's the, the will or the, the, the wish of every designer that, that his design will be reproduced. I mean, there, there is a design for. Um, so I think all design should be uh, distributed, but it's also important to protect the designers and their ideas. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it won't be a solution to just like give it away, you know? As, at least I think that's some lesson I learned also in this process when it actually got a bit too big for myself as not being a manager or but just a designer, that you also need the protection. Kate, mm -hmm. could you react yeah. to that? I'd love to because this is something that we're kind of moving towards and and it's definitely something that yeah it's not just you who is is having this experience but we're actually it kind of connects to the digital um, that you're talking about before that we're kind of living in a moment of explosion in terms of how we can actually harness the digital harness things like blockchain nft smart contracting these kinds of things and we're in a really uh, good position as a platform to be able to start looking at how those can be kind of engage within these digital platforms to indeed protect our designers, to ensure that we're getting, you know, the the um, payments and, you you know, you're, you're receiving the, the visibility for your work. And also I think, you know, in also materials, these kinds of things, the sovereignty of materials, where they come from, where they circulate, these kinds of ideas, which maybe four years ago when we started the platform seemed a little bit wacky now four years later you know we're seeing nfts in in the mainstream media and they're becoming much more let's say able to be socialized within um, our design community so we will actually have a report c coming out in the next month so this is the first step okay and so that's something to look I forward to i will be to. emailing it directly to you so and, you can uh, take uh, a look and yeah. i think yeah and this is just to step. finish this conversation uh what else is is going on right now and is uh going to be uh, the next steps uh, on the platform? Well, the next le steps are very um, immediate. We will have both this um, this report and also our latest book coming out in the next month. So this is how we kind of sum the, the platform year annually is with um, a publication. And this year the publication is called This is Distributed Design. So you actually heard it here first. This, okay. hasn't, been, yeah. <laughs> this hasn't been announced. Um, and it will be out in the next year, in the next few weeks by the end of the month. Um, so this is the next thing. And it, it 
completes a series of four books that we've developed. So we got a preview here. Yeah, you should. Thank you so them. much. <laughs> Thank all of you. Thank you, Jiao. And uh, Thank you. We're going to go to the next. Please take your seat in, in, uh, in the audience. And I would like to uh, introduce my next guest, uh, Chris, Chris Julien. Please join me at the table. Uh, Chris is a senior research fellow at, uh, at WAG, and uh, he's going to introduce us to another European project, and it's called T-Factor. And it's all about uh, co-creating cities with temporary urbanism. Well, that's a mouthful, but maybe you can explain it a little bit in layman terms to all of us. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so what we talk about in T-Factor is the, is the meanwhile spaces in cities, uh, especially in regenerative projects of urban regeneration, have big uh, master plans that stretch out 20, 25 years with all these big real estate developers, municipalities, incredibly complex, huge plans that are made far into the future. And we kind of, as T-Factor, look to kind of hack those systems and those those big visions of, of what the city should look like together with communities and use temporary practices, meanwhile practices as ways to kind of influence these big oil tankers of, of urban development and make them more agile, in particular in, in times that are quite uncertain and become more and more chaotic if we look, for example, at climate challenges and ecological challenges. So, so what are so? Is it about using space temporarily, or is it about other things that you uh, do on on a more temporary scale? So it's kind of mobilizing uh, all the capacities that a city has: uh, its inhabitants, its its social fabrics, its creativity, uh, its its makership, and trying to piece together the elements that are present in certain spaces, in certain communities and locations, and bring those forward into these master plans to kind of enhance, in particular, the well-being and the social cohesion uh, in these neighborhoods and areas. Yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of the makers in Amsterdam that I talk about, they have a lot of uncertainty, right? So they, they have these lease contracts of uh, one year, two years, three years, and they don't know how much their uh, their rent is going to be after that, if they can stay. Uh, so they actually don't want to be uh, part of a temporary solution. They want to be part of a permanent solution. Mm -hmm. how, how would you rea react to that? I mean, I, 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 I can completely uh, uh, commiserate with that. And I think it's a really sort of important topic you touch on. I think what we're doing with T-Factor is kind of um, trying to sensitize the powers that be, so to speak, that develop these urban uh, projects with these huge time spans into not just rolling them out over these huge uh, periods, but kind of becoming sensitive to all the needs and uh, and capacities that are in these areas, including, for example, uh, needs for housing or, or, or creative spaces where people can work and live. Um, but it's not the case that we're going for a top-down policy-oriented method, right? So we're not trying to sit at the table where the master plans are being drawn. We're trying to kind of go into the areas where they're being rolled out and to show by the power of example what kind of practices can influence in a positive way these yeah. developments. And, and, and uh, so, so uh, you heard about Centrino, you heard mm. about distributed design. How, does, how do these come together in like uh, generating common goals with all of these projects? Do yeah. you think there are any common goals and what would they be? That's a good question. I mean, I think uh, in terms of practice or method, what we're seeing is uh, in Centrino and the distributed design paradigm really comes from the designer, right? So from the person uh, facilitating the process and trying to kind of like imagine different types of futures where uh, T-Factor, I think, is more citizen-oriented, so it's more about kind of mobilizing all these different actors that are in these urban spaces uh, towards shared visions. So I think we're a bit less about the ideas and a bit more about the process in that respect. So, for example, in Amsterdam, we're doing an urban ecology pilot at the Amsterdam Science Park. You see an image here on the screens. Um, and it's called a park, and in, on its good days, you could really say it's a park. On its bad days, you could say it's like a big boxes uh, stuffed into an area. Uh, super uh, pre, uh, um, 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 respected uh, science institutions are there. Uh, but the question is sort of how do uh, yeah, locals interact with this space and how can we keep the space also a, a qualitative place to, to be and not just a sort of kind of claustrophobic uh, set of functional buildings. So one of the thematics that's turning up here is, is definitely urban ecology and well-being. Uh, but we have a number of thematic labs that also touch on uh, makership, on creativity and, and artistry. 
on social inclusion uh, and on climate change and resilience. Uh, so there's a number of these topics that we're kind of trying to explicitly draw in and draw in uh, also knowledge partners from all across Europe to, to kind of enrich the pilots that we're doing. Yeah, so so um, like the ideas of the uh, of these projects can come together in uh, certain areas within cities, right? Exactly. So we kind of designed a, a flexible stru structure in these six cities where we're doing our pilots. So in Milan, Kaunas, uh, Amsterdam, London, uh, Bilbao and Lisbon. And, and it's kind of a flexible structure where we try to be responsive to what, what are the needs that are kind of like coming out of the communities and how can we kind of fly in all our European experts or train them in rather uh, to, to kind of like uh, supplement and, and enhance what's, what's going on locally. Okay, so we're going to use your way of looking at things to, to talk about our next three designers that are going to present themselves. Uh, we again have two people here in the studio and uh, one person in Zoom. Uh, let's start with Veronique Achoui. Uh, she is uh, from Reskilled and she's going to tell us what that is. I work for Restorative Justice Netherlands and I'm part of the movement Reskilled. We challenge the concept of prison and instead propose the concept of small-scale detention houses. I think it's important to realize that when we create circular cities, it is not only about economy, it is also about justice. Circular cities are about human interaction, communication and interrelatedness. With small-scale detention houses, we want to move beyond the paradigm of individualism. You cannot raise a person outside of society to become a perfect person and then expect them to be that same exact person upon re-entering society. Prisons disconnect people from their socio-economic context. Prisons disconnect misbehavior from its, from its historical origins that is often rooted in design flaws of society. Think about the inequality of opportunities. So what you see is that regaining a place in society becomes increasingly difficult when existing ties are broken while in prison. Reskilled assumes that people are defined by their immediate social structures and their social economic background. That is why detention houses are small scale, differentiated and embedded in communities. In such a structure, people in detention houses continue to remain connected to society. It is my aim that we redesign the, our criminal justice system into a circular justice system in which individuals are no longer punished for design flaws in our society, but instead responsibility is shared by all who see a leaf turning yellow. Great. Thank you very much. Come and join us. And I'm uh, going to present our next speaker, uh, Peter Wouda, who calls himself Baumeester at uh, Stichting Tijd. In the late 1960s, an interesting experiment started in the town of Hirnveen. An urban space of one kilometer long, where only grass was growing, was turned into a chaotic environment. Tons of used bricks, tiles and old walls were placed on top of the lawn. After this, people started, started organizing this chaos by stacking the stones into building blocks and the diversity of trees and shrubs was planted. After that, it was nature's turn to react on a new situation. Year after year, until this very day, local residents and nature work together. The result after more than 50 years, you can see it here, is that the area turned from a monoculture to a complex ecological site. The idea came from Louis Leroy, born in Amsterdam, who later called these places eco-cathedrals. All over the Netherlands and across Europe, similar initiatives started. He was interested in very long-term thinking, which is now also known as cathedral thinking. He demanded that all cities should leave 1% without any planning. There, space is given time and time is given space in order to make cities circular and sustainable. He signed a 100-year letter of intent with the local government to achieve this. Thank you very much. Please join us.
And uh, then we have uh, one uh, Zoom speaker, or uh, one Zoom designer, uh, Petro Saez Martinez, uh, co-founder of Disigno Ambeta. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone, as uh, Thomas says. Um, I'm co-founder of Design in Beta, a circular and social design studio with my mate Alex and also Mark. And we identified uh, two challenges regarding uh, our cities. One is uh, food waste, the, the huge amount of food and organic waste that we produce. And the other one is the disconnection uh, from nature that we suffer here. So we envisioned a modular solution which uh, would adapt to, to every home, even small homes, and to everyone, uh, everyone's needs, needs. But we are aware that we need to switch from individual product design to systems thinking. That's, uh, we, we need to engage community to make uh, cities really circular. And that's why we uh, thought uh, not only of a product, but also of a uh, platform where people could uh, download the files, uh, use them, change them, uh, exchange uh, information and experiences. And we also designed uh, an educational program around the product. So uh, community is powerful and sharing knowledge can boost an innovation project. So right now we are searching for partners to, to boost this project, Compon. And uh, we would like to have uh, composting experts, local uh, uh, network of local manufacturers and web developers and so on. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Much. And this cry out is noted. Thank you very much. Please join us at the digital table. And uh, uh, Veronique, I want to start with you because uh, you define circularity in a different way from a lot of other people. A lot of other people think about circularity as a circularity of materials, but you think about a circularity of people, if, if I can call it that. You call it circular justice. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, yeah, maybe it's it's easiest to start with um, like, like Rousseau who wrote this book about... Uh, um, how a person could be educated outside of in nature because this is a pure and then that person could become a perfect person and a good person but then to me I never I always felt that was really weird because I'm a very different person when I see my mother or when I'm with friends and and there's a other philosopher Levinas uh, Emmanuel Levinas and he, he said like your my identity is defined by um, when I meet another person and I've always kept that in my mind so what we do for me in the criminal justice system is we something happens a situation happens and we we say okay this is the date that something happens you will be punished for it and you go to prison and then uh, we'll see what happens well nobody we don't care what happens of course you have this reintegration programs but um, that's that's to me, in my opinion, uh, like Munchausen by proxy syndrome, because we create this really unhealthy environment, which are called prisons, and then we create create a cure for it. So for me, I think when it's about circular justice, the story begins much earlier um, uh, with inequality of opportunities with our society that is not equal in so many ways. And then, and that's also what you see um, of the population in prisons. Usually, they are from different uh, groups, from um, uh, so not never the national uh, group. Like in every in Netherlands, it's the Dutch population is not the biggest group of with with. Um, um, and and but in Italy, in every country, it's the minority group or the groups that are have a different background. I don't like the group, the word minority group, but. Uh, people that have a different background, they are usually in prison. People that have... They are overrepresented. Overrepresentative or lower educated people are overrepresented in prisons. 10% uh, in the Netherlands uh, is in prison because they have debt and so they didn't commit any other crimes. They didn't murder anyone. They didn't hit anyone. They just had debt. So I think we need to go back to where did it actually start. Yeah, so, so circularity is also about how we 
uh, deal with people in our society. How we relate to each other. How we relate to, yeah, so deal is not, I, I was searching for the right word in my mind, but I, it didn't come, but how we relate to people in our society. And also, so, uh, in the detention houses that you are working on, uh, the, the, the people that are there, they're also part of the community and they also contribute to the community, right? Definitely. And I think it's very interesting what Chris said, because it's also it's the last thing I would want is that we replace all prisons by small scale detention houses, because then you're actually creating, again, a new infrastructure, which isn't the right answer. We also need to make better use of the houses we already have. And actually in Amsterdam alone, there are already 200 small scale houses that people go to after detention or during the last part of detention. So I think we should make first better use of the, the things we already have in society. And then, of course, there will always be a small group um, that, still needs, that still needs some kind of uh, liberty deprivation. And then for that group, of course, you can do it differently. And then you also relate to the neighborhood and what Kate said before as well. Like it should, it's, it's, it's local... Yeah. Is there also a relationship between the circular justice and maybe the uh, material circularity or the sustainable uh, uh, world, that, uh, how the sustainable world sees circularity? I think personally, I just learn a lot from the, the design and the way of thinking in, in, the, in, in, in the world of products and circular economy. But there's no, um, I mean, for me, I, I I thought of the word circular justice, but it's not a concept that is out there yet. I do hope that it will become more common knowledge. I see there's a Pedro wants to say something. Oh, Pedro, yes, please. I uh, I, I didn't see you there, but do you want to co comment on this? Yeah, uh, have you, Veronique, have you finished? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, okay, okay. No, I just wanted to say uh, this relationship between people and material circularity might be in the way that we decide, our system decides uh, what things are, what materials are waste. And in the same way, it decides which people are waste or, or have no value in the, in the, same, uh, in the same way for yeah. our society. So they must be uh, yeah, so so we uh, lose the value of these people by saying, okay, you're in prison and now it doesn't matter anymore what we do after, right? That's something. Yeah, uh, so actually a regenerative culture should uh, regenerate not only uh, the materials and the, the nature, but also people relationships. Yeah, that's the way. Yeah, so uh, so we'll, we'll, let's stay with you. So um, you're based in Valencia. I, I don't know uh, if I mentioned that before. Uh, Valencia will be the, the world design capital in 2022. Uh, yeah, but, but you say that you're missing like a strategy uh, uh, so towards, for example, design as a, as a main agent for social change and urban innovation. Uh, uh, what is it that you're missing exactly? Is it this uh, kind of approach that we were talking about before? Um, perhaps, but I also meant, uh, actually, there are some social design or even uh, circular design programs, but, but to me, they are not enough. And they are some way more superfluous. And they, they are, yeah, they... they uh, they should be more, I think. In that way. Uh, yeah. So, so all three of you are are really uh, trying to design a different system, uh, and uh, so what do you think, uh, Pedro? That are um, aspects that are um, aspects of design that could really help a system change. So, design in the end is about thinking how things should be, not only products or graphics, but even business models or even, um, uh, let's say, the public policies. So if we have been for years, for centuries, doing the same things, and we've got 
in design, we can find some methodologies, creative methodologies to innovate and to do things differently, because actually we, we need to do things in a different way. So, and, so and maybe. Yeah, and, and how are you moving from uh, doing like product design to more systems design? So that's a difficult question, actually. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, this thing of switching from individual action to collective, to community action, to to listening and, and co-creating with different actors, with different stakeholders. I think that's uh, key to to really to redesign or design not just products or concrete uh, items, but uh, let's say systems. Yeah. At least at scale. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Peter, uh, I want to come to you. Uh, that's also what you have a lot of experience with in uh, talking with a lot of stakeholders in uh, retaining these uh, eco cathedrals or little walk gardens. Uh, we were talking about temporary solutions earlier, but you are uh, doing like a one hundred year lease contract with uh, for a start yes. yeah for a start yes. we just start with 100 years and then yes. we'll look what happens well nature is uh, always evolving there is no end to the evolution so why uh, should we stop and think in products uh, we should think in processes and that's what eco cathedrals are uh, all about it's a process a continuous process so what I find interesting is, uh, so this was uh, probably distributed design avant la lettre because uh, it is already from decades ago that this started. Yes, um, it's um, more than 50 years ago that uh, Leroy started this. And then you could see that all over uh, the Netherlands and also in France and Germany, projects were started. Uh, but always um, politics said about five, ten years well, um, it was a nice project, but uh, we move on to a next. And um, there are uh, just a few projects uh, left uh, that are still uh, uh, working. And it's very uh, uh, sad, I guess. Uh, and I think Amsterdam is uh, ready for uh, an uh, eco-cathedral uh, process. Yeah, so, so uh, there are now a lot of uh, municipalities that are actually interesting interested in uh, doing this again, right? Yes, we uh, many uh, municipalities they visit uh, us and they come and see how we uh, how we do it. Um, it's also open source building. We don't have a trademark on it. Uh, everybody who can um, uh, who wants to uh, use it, they can use it uh, in their own uh, environment and. Um, so I guess it's it's for a city. It's good to have places like uh, like this, where uh, well, as I said, uh, space gets time and time gets space. Yeah, places that are left alone as well, and there is not so much of a, of a plan for it. Yeah, kind of uh, wastelands, uh, um, and well, there is no plan in nature, and there should be. Uh, continuous evolution. There is no drawing of, uh, there's no landscape architect who says uh, uh, it uh, has uh, to be like this, the, uh, the yeah. result, but so, it's an ongoing process. Yeah, so yeah. space gets time and time gets space. Uh, uh, this is a great luxury, actually. How do you look at the the, the things of the we talked about uh, that is, are being developed in T-Factor? Do you see any um, parallels with what you're doing? Yeah, sure. I, I, I read about T-Factor. We spoke uh, before uh, this. Um, their ideas, uh, what I uh, learned from it is uh, start with a temporary project uh, uh, and see how this can evolve in the in a, in a longer term uh, process. Um, well, I, I think it's uh, it's nice to talk uh, further after uh, this and see how we can um, uh, cooperate. Yeah, oh, that's great. Do you uh, do you see any cooperation possibilities 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think with T-Factor, the, the, let's say, ideology is to start with temporariness and to find also your fit, to find your combinations, your communities and your, your practices, and then to develop them into more regular, stable, permanent uh, uses, but to do so also really from this position of show don't tell so beginning with small things i really like also this kind of phrase saying that uh, the next big thing is a thousand little things so also to really try to seed different types of practices and see what attracts people and what really kind of has a certain uh, internal logic to it that can stand the test of time and i think opening up these kinds of spaces i mean it's you could say it's the reverse it's bringing deep time into the present and it's not being temporary but actually it's like a really thin layered, like a speck cook, we would say in Dutch, of temporariness, right? Of people stacking up the stones of yeah. all, the, all the plants and ecosystems coming in and, and wrapping themselves together. So maybe for me would even, I could say it's like a model for T-factor practices so expressed I, in bricks and plants. Yeah, so I don't know how you translate speck cook into... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> layer cake. A, a kind I think. of a layered cake <laughs> yeah. with all Sorry different colors. That. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so uh, I find it very interesting that you're all talking about growing communities and uh, that that is so important for uh, reaching your goals. I, I would just like to know from, from all of you actually, what kind of stakeholders or what kind of people are you not yet talking to within your communities that you would really like to talk to? Maybe, do you have anybody in mind that you would like to have the next conversation with that maybe is watching? Um, good question. I don't, I don't think one specific group has the answer. So I really do believe in, in, in working on it together because otherwise you create another specific system with a... So yeah, so what I have are, to pass, I think. What, what are the next steps for you that you want to take? Well, um, I think one one of the things we're working on now is to, to create an Airbnb website, but then focusing on these small-scale detention houses forms that already exist. So how does that work? It's uh, So at the moment, um, so when somebody gets three months prison... It's they there's the option of a prison and they have forensic care or um, or the care system, so but we need to have these these thousand examples of of the way you can uh, differentiate between what people need, uh, so actually have a website just like Airbnb with thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of houses all over Europe where we can send people like you are now in prison but you actually are um, uh, addicted so you, a better place for you to stay is here so so the places that should fit their skills and also their problems yes but also it should also be community integrated so the people uh, they need to add value for themselves uh, to the community so Actually, just like you and us in our neighborhoods, like, do we v create value for our neighborhoods? Like, some do, some don't, but just, you know. So, yeah, an Airbnb for detention houses. It sounds very cozy. <laughs> 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 but it's a great next step. I'm really looking forward to that as well. Uh, uh, Peter, you, uh, I, I was asking, who would you like to talk to to bring your project a step further? Uh, we have the luxury that we don't have to invite people because people, people are come to, to us. You. What yeah, are you doing great. there? <laughs> and uh, but our uh, goal is that uh, we don't want to be unique uh, location. Now there are just a few eco cathedrals, uh, but we don't want to be unique. We want all over the Netherlands and maybe in other countries uh, that places like this. Uh, yeah, come so. That's so are we going international as well? Yes, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, well, in, in Germany, in France, uh, Leroy had uh, projects, but they, uh, as I said, they, uh, they stopped yeah. uh, too soon. So uh, maybe it's time to start again. Okay, great. And uh, so um, uh, maybe to you, so who would you like to talk to? Yeah, so... Um, Speaking on behalf of T-Factor is hard in that sense that sort of all these uh, pilots have their very own 
points in time in their master plans and uh, uh, and some have really need citizens because it's still kind of an empty industrial area and others have lots of citizens but they lack investment or something for for Amsterdam uh, science park we're really looking to I mean speaking is maybe a big word but really to talk with the more than human inhabitants of the park and to really try to understand sort of what all, what the two foxes that live uh, around the neighborhood and the bats and the birds what they would need from the science park to keep it as a flourishing area that people also love to be in. So that's kind of our next stakeholder engagement challenge to okay. speak with uh, non-humans. To speak with the non-humans. <laughs> and how are you trying to go and do that? Yeah, so we're, so we're trying to build up a <laughs> methodology around that called the arts of noticing. So it's, it kind of really starts with paying like really granular attention to your surroundings, doing a lot of walks with people, uh, trying to sort of see and listen uh, what's, what's going on uh, with other inhabitants of the park and doing it with kids with scientists with artists with people who uh, by their nature look in really different ways at the park yeah. and try to build up the starting points for dialogue there. and really getting nature place at the table great yeah. and uh pedro to you as a, a final say for this for this round uh who would you still really like to talk to or what is your next step so right now, as, uh, as I said, we are searching for partners. So we will need to to speak to, to people who are experts in in composting or even recycling, and then uh, local manufacturers or even uh, we thought of um, precious plastic as well. And uh, yeah. Maybe for the educational program, we'll have to, to talk to, to, the, to the public uh, sector uh, so that we can develop um, uh, this program in, the, in schools, uh, high schools. Yeah, so, so you also have to be linked with Jiao, I think, right? So uh, we need to do that as well. So very best of luck with that. Best of luck to all of you. And thank you for being here. Please take your seats again in the audience and a round of applause for all of you. And we're going to uh, the last two of our pitches. They're already getting ready. Um, so we have two more designers uh, joining us here tonight. Uh, actually, the first uh, initiative is, is two designers, Cynthia Rivera and Federica Mara. And Federica is going to do the pitch. So, uh, Federica, the floor is yours. Yes. Hello, everyone. So, yes, I'm Federica, one of the co-founders of the Coffee Wasters, and uh, Cynthia is here with me in the room. And we are a team of two friends, fueled uh, by coffee, but also by the belief that disruptive design is the way to incorporate sustainability in our daily lives uh, and also <coughs> make circular thinking the norm. We uh, want to support in our mission urban citizens uh, to turn their daily habits uh, into more circular ones, uh, but also to have some benefit uh, for themselves and the community they are in. Unfortunately, sustainability is still like a privileged choice uh, for many and many contexts. Uh, you it's either expensive, it can be niched, it can be time consuming to be sustainable or just very difficult to adopt because people don't know where to start. Sometimes we are torn between the most accessible choice and the most sustainable one and we feel that shouldn't be the case. We want to find a way to democratize sustainable actions and by doing that we want to believe and bring up microactivism where everyday small choices can make a big impact. Um, we want to study daily habits uh, of urban citizens and see how we can transform them through the design process uh, into something that can make a change. And yeah, in the end, daily habits uh, are not really targeted uh, as opportunity for change very often, uh, but I think we think it's really there that people can really make their own change. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Please you. Join us. And the last of our uh, designers uh, actually calls himself an uh, eco-deviant artist. So uh, that's very promising. Uh, the floor is uh, yours, Arthur Guillemignot. Hi, um, I'm Arthur. I'm here to present you my project of 
piss soap. Uh, I would say it's self-explanatory. It is a soap that is the combination of used frying oil, of wood ashes from any fireplace, and fresh piss. Uh, all those materials are very easy waste from human activity. You can find them easily on the local scale, uh, even can be sourced on a domestic scale, I would say, if you have the tools and a nice fireplace. <laughs> uh, all of this makes, for me, piss soap a very accessible and uh, democratic cleaning product, mainly for the outdoor, because the smell can be intense. But uh, <laughs> So it requires altogether very little energy and very little facility, but mostly it can connect local audience to their waste management, which I find quite interesting. Uh, I, for me, I present Piss Soap not only as a sustainable project, not only as a circular project, but I think it's a new regenerative product for our city that we can see. So I would say um, get a big glass of water, um, join me <laughs> on this eco-deviant adventure, and I hope that together we can kind of renew and review a bit the conditioning that we have about what is disgusting, what is gruesome, and what is filth. Great, thank you. Give it up for Arthur and Piss Hope, everybody. And uh, you're also a winner. Kate was already uh, referring to it, uh, but you won a Distributed Design Award. Please join us at the table. So how was that? Um, unexpected, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I, I started Piss Soap with this idea that um, no one did it, so in a way someone had to. So that, that's at least how I see an artist's job. And, um, and then I understood the potential that Piss Soap had for, first for me, uh, for the local community, and then I thought everyone around. So, so yeah, the award was uh, uh, strange enough that I understood that other people could recognize this abundance within my project, which is, yeah, very comforting, but also uh, gives you an idea that this project deserves to have more, more implementation in the world around you. So, so it was a sort of um, a very comforting reward, but also sort of kicking the butt to go further with it. Yes. So, so uh, actually, the connection between the both of you is how you use design to actually change the way or try and change the way people think or try and change the way people act. And you do it with what you call gruesome materials uh, like like urine or like uh, other materials as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, urine was used already in antique times for many different use. So uh, I think the term gruesome came very late in a way in the yeah. idea of Western society. So we have to do the gruesome like this, gruesome, right? Yeah, yeah I, I'd rather do that. <laughs> um, yeah. and, um, and that's why I thought like, why not bringing urine, which is a bio product, a bio waste, which means that everyone here and everyone on the planet urinates which makes so much liters of potential ways that we could use to actually do things that we do in our everyday life. So I found urine to become like a, a material that can be implemented in our society very easily because it's democratic. Everyone urinate the same. So for me, Pissop is not really a product, and I don't want to present it as such. I really want to push it as a movement. Yeah. I, I don't want to sell Pissop because I'm, I'm not going to sell piss to people that they can do themselves. So Pissop is really about you doing it yourself. It's about you encountering your own bioproduct, encountering your own vision about your disgust, but also the conditioning that society gave upon your vision of this yeah. can, I, can I have a look at it? And yeah. can I have a smell at it as well? <laughs> no, it, you don't. It smells like uh, mm. like any other soap, actually. Yeah. But, it doesn't smell like piss, if but, that's the question. But, but, <laughs> but you say it smells when you're, uh, uh, when you're washing with it. The, the frying oil can smell like very strong, and that's why I think that uh, as as outdoor cleaning product in the implementation of the city, I think it makes more sense. So, 
So I think step by step, people can make this, um, let's say, decolonization of disgust on their own. But I think that's using urine is one step and then using frying oil smell on your skin is something else. So I think that's why I want to propose it more of a, as an outdoorsy product. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know if everybody agrees with the, the term uh, decolonization of disgust, but uh, yeah, I can understand what you mean. Uh, um, uh, so how do both of you look at, at this? And I mean, this? I agree. Coming from an ex-colony as well, like I, I, I do agree that uh, also cleaning habits or anything that we have been used to in these days has some sort of Western imposition towards our way of thinking as well. So it is as, as designers and as makers also our job to analyze the sort of behaviors that we have been and I wouldn't say imposed to until a certain extent, but the choices that we have have been designed and therefore are colonized. And it's still a process of colonization, this imposition of choice. So in that sense, I, I do agree that it's a decolonial okay, action. Okay, there, there you go. <laughs> and, 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 and also, so, um, the way, I, uh, I, like I said before, you, you share that you use design to make people uh, question the way they think. Uh, you, you call it micro-activism. So what is micro-activism for you? Uh, maybe Federica? Sure. And I'm, I'm sorry because I didn't introduce you correctly as well, <laughs> because uh, you were not the one who, who was doing the pitch, but uh, Cynthia Rivera has joined and you both are, uh, are doing this, uh, this, uh, this project, the Coffee Wasters. Yeah. I mean, I was there in spirit, I hope, <laughs> a little bit. You were there in spirit, very, very much so. Yeah. But uh, maybe first, uh, could you say a little bit more about the coffee wasters and, and, and then talk about microactivism? And it's still me. <laughs> okay. Any, any of you, it's uh, fine. Yeah, um, well, I think both me and Cynthia wanted to do something for our community. We feel we are urban citizens, we live in Amsterdam, and we want to act in our local environment. And that brought us in many endless discussions, some of which overnight, that's why the coffee wasters, so because there was a lot of coffee involved, um, to think, what can we do? And we started to discuss what can we change and what we can analyze to bring this change forward, how we can make our lives more circular or more sustainable. We both work for a sustainability uh, NGO, so that's where also like we got inspired by, by it. Um, the Coffee Wasters is just for now a project that we want to launch more and start to explore really different aspects of the daily life of a urban citizen and what you can do to actually break patterns so that again, have been designed not by you, but by others. So, so uh, we talked before about uh, community and stepping down from individualism, but this is kind of a good individualism? I mean, we, we believe that everyday decisions in a community have an impact. And therefore, if you target individuals, especially habits, you create a sort of cons um, consistency it is a bit of marketing as well, right? That we are programmed to do specific things. So the way that we have consumed or also the way that we choose our products is very much programmed. Therefore, it's a habit. Right now, I don't know about you, but I've been receiving a lot of information about 70% clothing and I've been really kind of trying to control myself. So then I said, no, I don't really need that extra sweater. Maybe I I, I actually asked Federica two days ago for a sweater, so my my stay with it for a year who knows <laughs> but uh but what we want to target is is understanding or making use of design with to to study habits to identify how we can disrupt those business patterns and because we believe that everyday choices have an impact so uh, our vision is mostly not to only encourage big sustainable choices such as like by the this most expensive backpack made by plastic rescue from the ocean, but rather we want more sustainable practices such as reducing that 
plastic from the ocean. So yeah. why to start at the very end buying something sustainable or going into that specific niche that is very much not accept, uh, accessible to us yeah. working on sustainability, working yeah. in an NGO. So do you have a great example of a design really challenging our habits in this respect? You had a whole list, I think. Oh, you have a whole list. <laughs> I have my whole list. Okay, you said, do don't whole, overprepare. Do, do, do but the whole <laughs> list, yeah. Um, well, for instance, our daily habit that I think is very nice and we have experience with some friends and also within our work environment are swap markets. So we talk a lot about uh, buying more sustainable, buying circular products. Uh, but the question is, why do you need to buy at all? Like there is an overproduction of goods in a lot of, of sectors. And especially we live in a privileged part of the world where we do have access to these goods. And... We want to break that pattern. And so like at work, for instance, before the COVID uh, um, started, we used to do swap markets where basically people would bring what they wanted to exchange and then you just create that type of community. So that's like a very basic example that you can do in your own house, in your own building, in your neighborhood, like you can potentially expand it as much as you want. And that's like one of the many examples that I can give you, but... Okay, give, are, give us one more example. <laughs> okay, there is um, a very nice, for instance, or a um, startup that is based in Spain, which is called Symbiosis, uh, and they are also a European project, uh, and they are studying um, what waste is produced in some countries, and they map it against which countries use those materials as primary materials uh, and they try to link the two so that like you can close the loop but that's not much on daily habits uh, of an individual but it's on daily habits of industries uh. so it's also nice to think like habit has a very broad sense like you can interpret it in many ways and it's nice to see like how you can disrupt different levels yeah yeah do you also see it as your role as an artist to challenge daily habits um for me, I take the role of the artist to propose new possibilities. So that, that entails, in a way or another, challenging, I would say, routines. Yeah. Because new possibilities need to be outside of they, the routine. Yeah. So um, then, of course, there is a, a part where I understand that um, a creative idea is great, but then how do you give access? How do you... Uh, bring this to the people that actually need to engage with it. And I think that's the most difficult part to find, especially with a project like Piss Soap, which um, on on the level of um, the presentation sounds really good. And then you need to encounter it physically. Yeah. And then there is like a real big gap between the step of the theory and the practice, and especially for everyone, I would say. So I think that maybe you also encounter the same, like in changing daily practices people are there and they think that the theory is great but then how do you implement it in a way that it stays it sustains itself over time and that actually it develops even further that's kind of for me the the most difficult part of i think our practices in general yeah, yeah for sure i mean there's a whole science and of of how something becomes a habit there's all these uh, hacks, like if you do something for 30 days, then you'll be able to do it for the rest of your life. Uh, you, you can find TED Talks and books and etc. But I think overall, it's more or less to understand the principles of why are you doing something. And, and I guess this is also where you come from, right? Like, well, I, I, I need to give you the options of how to create a new routine. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, habits are very much embedded in the agency of the person who's conducting that. And then that's the place of the community as well. So we, uh, in our vision, we want to provide the options of, for you to disrupt this habit. Yeah, in the so, yeah this way. is also what I really like about you. You want to offer alternatives and you do that with uh, the, the coffee wasters. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, how do you deal with like... Uh, actually knowing what is sustainable or, or dealing with not knowing how sustainable some of the possibilities that you offer really are? Oh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm going to let you answer <laughs> because I know you, do, you have the answer. You're, you're passing this on? <laughs> yeah, I've talked a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Federica. Um, 
yeah, I think what I really love about the design process per se is that you are always brought to question uh, what your hypothesis is starting. So like with the coffee wasters, we had this great idea of creating this platform uh, to save food waste and then sending off to food banks uh, the, the surplus. And we contacted food banks all over Amsterdam and no one is interested. <laughs> and <laughs> And then we thought, okay, are we going to keep pushing for our idea or are we like trying to understand what is wrong and how we can improve it? So I think it's about being humble and recognize that you're there not to launch your idea and for yourself, so to feel good about what you're doing, but because you want to create an impact. So go back to the drawing board, question it, and discuss with more people, uh, uh, find new stakeholders uh, and get inspired again. And I think that is what makes this type of process uh, for me the valuable because it's all about continuously improving uh, yeah. and ameliorating. So, so you need to be ready to reiterate again and again. Always. And I think one of the things that have uh, really been our mantra is that we're not the norm. So as a designer, as a maker, as whoever you are, you're definitely not the norm. And I think Veronique was also mentioning that there's not one person that I really want to talk to, but I want to make sure that this kind of caters to everyone until a certain extent, because you also cannot make everyone happy. But, uh, but if you get out of this idea that you're designing for your bubble, and as you said, iterating it, and also understanding that sustainability, might n your choice might not be entirely fully sustainable and might never be but it can be a, a reduce of impact so yeah i think that also helps all right what do you think about this because you more or less uh challenge and you also uh uh you bring new ideas to the table but you don't i i don't think you uh are are th thinking so much about reiterating your ideas again and again or are you I mean, for me, it was quite simple to see the sustainability in piss soap. I just took trash. Yeah. Then, and then I thought, oh, wow, I can do something with the trash. So I, I think from a, that movement cannot be unsustainable. And that's why I call it regenerative, because I think that's also what we need in the climate crisis we are in is I think sustainability is not going to get us that far. It's a very good beginning, but how do we regenerate? Because we might have been past the point where sustainability is going to cut it out. So I thought if we focus on what we have surrounding us, which is indeed tons of waste, tons of dirt once again, and all of this, and assembling it to create something that everyone can use on an everyday basis, it's kind of... So, for me, this approach of sustainability was a very easy path. Then can I do it with other bioproducts? Yeah, so, so are, there, are there any other gruesome materials that you're now working with or other products that you're now trying to regenerate or other chapters to uh, creating a regenerative narrative? Well, I'm not going to lie that PACE has so much to offer. that PACE has so much to I'm, offer. I'm not done with it yet. Yeah. So, uh, so, no, so, I, so what's the next thing in PACE? Um, for me, now the next step would really be amazing if I could implement it on a local scale here in Amsterdam and create like a recycling point, a factory point where I invite the locals to do their own piss soap. They can bring it home. And here I go, I hope like bringing this platform to another place. And so teaching and being able to help local population in their waste management and in uh, changing their conditioning is all the work for me of piss soap. Yeah, this actually, so there's also talk about this on an industrial scale with, uh, I don't know the English word, but the waterschappen. And they are actually uh, going to, f from from waste management into like a resource factory from the wastewater that we have in the, in the community. So that's a great uh, combination as well, I think. Yeah. And uh, so, how about you? What is the next chapter for you? Okay. Um, well, first, we are working right now on uh, the food rescue platform, which is this idea uh, that Federica introduced, in which it's, it's still in the ideation phase, but we want to make sure um, that uh, three elements uh, of, of what is going on in the city, especially during COVID, um, 
kind of get together because we also believe that one sustainability problem is not isolated. It is embedded within a system. So we want to um, uh, reduce food waste that is created uh, from Horeca. Uh, how do you say that in English? Um, so restaurants, bars, yeah. all these things. <laughs> I'm becoming Dutch apparently, little by little. But um, and also we want to make sure that food banks we have been uh, um, really impacted by COVID, uh, especially during the years. Uh, there's a reduction of of uh, money going in uh, from governments, from individuals. So it's also the the most waste that there has been in terms of food and the least amount of uh, support that the food banks have. And on top of that, there's a lot of waste in terms of, of packaging, especially well because of COVID, you were staying at home, so then you really wanted to ask for that pizza that came in this carton box. And then, well, uh, I don't know about you, but us, uh, we re were really struggling to find a place where we could recycle the carton, for instance. I walked like two or three blocks just to find that specific spot that was free. So we want to uh, find... Um, that um, really iterate our ideas, try to find out what the stakeholders' designs needs are, and create uh, and, and launch that. On top of that, Federica just had a really great idea based on, on her partner that is sitting there, and uh, we want to kind of launch um, uh, a sustainable guide for Christmas. Uh, so kind of your habits that you have and how to make them more sustainable. So we're working on that. Okay, great, great ideas. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for being here. All of our guests here tonight. And uh, thank you all for watching at home as well. Uh, we're now calling it uh, an end here. And uh, see you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>